okay all right so treating okay. hypocortisolism i thought we'll cover why this topic respecting hypocortisolism when to screen part 1 of diagnosis how to screen part 2 of diagnosis how to confirm why do we treat it how do we treat it and then we summarize so why this topic uh, this was dr difranzo talking in this year's ada only three people from our country probably were sitting in that lecture when dr difranzo said that this probably is the most important lecture of this year's conference i'm sorry if there were more and i'm not aware <laughs> but it uh, what i know is that pansi sir me and makkar sir were sitting and sorry 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 purvi sorry sir so five right time is running so the reason is because this probably is something that we need to explore more we don't know a lot of things about uh, this topic the counter arguments which started in my mind when i heard this topic and probably dr desai is going to have these topics these points in his mind that we always thought cushing is very rare it's difficult to diagnose it's difficult to evaluate it's difficult to treat and it doesn't matter if you don't treat because the subclinical cushing that has been known to us for a long period of time and the notion previously was that even if you treat subclinical cushing the outcomes do not change so it is first of all it is not rare the catalyst study which was done showed that if you identify group of people with uncontrolled diabetes i'll come to what does it mean 24% of them will have hypercortisolism this is the most shocking information for me from dr difranzo's talk that in uncontrolled patients that were included in catalyst trial 24% had hypercortisolism so every fourth patient with uncontrolled diabetes the reason is probably hypercortisolism so catalyst was a phase 4 study of hypercortisolism in patients with difficult to treat type 2 diabetes despite receiving standard of care therapies assessing prevalence and treatment of mifepristone this is part 2 that is treatment with mifepristone we are not going to talk about this in this in this uh, talk so part 1 which is which was presented during ada was a prevalence phase as to understand is this problem common is this problem identifiable and then we'll go ahead whether treating it would be worth it or not so 24% that is the first message that a lot of patients have hypercortisolism as a reason for their uncontrolled diabetes now how did they identify uncontrolled diabetes this is a slide borrowed from dr adi mehta presented in makkar sir's conference three or more type 2 diabetes medications insulin and other type 2 diabetes medication especially people who are taking 500 units insulin that means a large dose of insulin to be uh, not very specific two or more type 2 diabetes medications with presence of more than one micro or macro vascular complication two or more type 2 diabetes medications and two or more hypertension medications now this is a very very common clinical profile for us many of our patients are uncontrolled on more than two anti diabetes medications uncontrolled hypertension with more than two anti hypertension medications so this is an extremely common clinical profile for us and if we believe that we can trans extrapolate their data to our data 25% of people who fall into this category are going to have hypercortisolism as the reason for uncontrolled uh, parameters from the metabolic syndrome i am not saying we can extrapolate the data right away but this is there is a reason to think about this so dr difranzo so showed we are all aware about the famous omega softet presented by him few years back and this was a slide showed by him during this presentation that it is noxious nine and hypercortisolism is going to be the ninth factor and that is going to contribute to what we have been talking about that not even 50% of our patients have controlled hbavc lot of our patients have uncontrolled diabetes in spite of treating with the standard of care and all that so we have to consider probably this as the ninth factor which will contribute to uncontrolled diabetes now about the well known or i would say conventional notions about cushing one is that we have to have a florid symptom or syndrome of cushing's to suspect hypercortisolism which is not very common if
if we consider if we exclude exogenous cushing which is because of exogenous steroid endogenous cushing has always been considered as a rare entity we should not suspect that in our clinical uh, teaching it was show it was suggested that we do not consider cushing as a very common disease but we don't have to wait for cushings to become a florid syndrome and then try to diagnose it if we can diagnose it at an earlier stage probably there is something that we can do so we don't really wait for florid clinical picture secondly we don't have to have very high levels of hypercortisolemia for it to be considered as a bad thing now they are considering to reduce the cutoffs of diagnosing cushing's uh, syndrome or disease because any excess is going to be bad from the metabolic parameters point of view now hypercortisolemia is an independent factor which is associated with increased cardiovascular mortality or morbidity so even if it is not causing the known abnormalities that we know which are associated with hypercortisolism that is uh, high blood glucose dyslipidemia hypertension in it, hypercortisolemia is an independent factor in itself it can in increase the cardiovascular mortality so in addition to treating the complications if we treat hypercortisolism probably will be able to reduce the cardiovascular mortality treating hypercortisolism improves symptoms so if you have a profile where uncontrolled diabetes and hypertension not controlled with more than two medications if you identify hypercortisolism if you evaluate further and find out a reason for hypercortisolism and if you treat it we are able to improve the parameters that are associated with hypercortisolism may it be easy bruising facial plexora weight gain hypertension diabetes and all that now the second counter argument that it is very difficult to diagnose so it is probably not if we use dexamethasone suppression test which is a sensitive test what does sensitive means it is good in ruling out hypercortisolism so we rule them out when we rule them in there is a problem further but first let's rule out so dexamethasone suppression test simply is take 1 mg of dexamethasone prior night and do serum cortisol next day morning anything more than 1.8 is abnormal so this is ruling in now we have to do decide what to do with it if the cortisol level comes more than 1.8 what do we do with this and i'm not going to talk about this because that is really complicated as to what do we do when the cortisol is more than 1.8 then we evaluate further whether it's really confirmatory if it is confirmatory from where the cortisol is coming whether it's from <laughs> or pituitary and then we do proper imaging there is a very good likelihood that this will create false diagnosis what is what we have already uh, always known as pseudo cushing and it might create diagnostics dilemmas but i don't think that's a reason for missing out those which we can probably provide better care to so how do we treat if you find an adrenal adenoma best way is to do the surgery and remove the adenoma but there are going to be a lot of people where you may not identify the adenoma we have the numbers but i will again not go for the short of time as to how many will have unilateral adenoma how many will have bilateral hyperplasia and all that there have been drugs which always were not so good in treating hypercortisol a lot of complications of the drug itself difficult to take them lot of cost non availability of these medications so drug treatment of cushing's was never a very favorite thing of either the doctor or the patient but probably what is happening in us and what was presented in the ada mifepristone and relacoralon are the two drugs that are been developed by the corsept pharmaceuticals which might be useful in these patients we we'll, the only the time will tell how much useful and how much side effects they have so coming back to summary of what i wanted to say the counter argument that the cushing's is rare probably it is not 24% of undiagnosed uh, uncontrolled type 2 diabetes uncontrolled hypertension is not rare i mean it's shockingly common it's difficult to diagnose it is not difficult to screen further after screening what happens might be complicated it's difficult to evaluate i agree it's difficult to treat right now if you find an adenoma it's not very difficult to treat drug treatment will have to wait for more data and if doesn't matter if you don't treat that's not true 
it, it matters if you treat it, the outcomes can improve. But we need more information from Western data and also we need to uh, do the same protocol in our patients and try to find out what is the real prevalence and what can be done for those patients. So with that, I'll end my argument on Thank time. You. Thank you, Anjali. Over to you, Dr. Piyush. Why we shouldn't treat it? First of all, thank you, Bansi Bhai, for inviting me. And it's a difficult topic because we have very few things to talk about. But I think my opponent made my job very easy because she was not talking about hypercortisolism to treat, but she was more sensitive about counter argument what I am going to speak about. So she was just giving answer to my counter questions what I am going to talk. So my answer is no. Definitely it's a new thing, so it's a better to debate a question without settling it than to settle a question without debating it. So is it fine to treat uncontrolled diabetes looking after hypercortisolism or just to treat uncontrolled diabetes in a better way? Why to complicate when we control diabetes? We have number of options available, number of better drugs available. Dr. Anjali was talking about we are not clear with the side effect and effect of the medicine which we are going to treat for hypercortisolemia, but it is we are clear with all with medicines available for diabetes management. So in that context, first thing I would like to put very strong question that hypercortisolism is a comorbidity is a co-consequence or it's a cause? She was putting more emphasis on cause of uncontrolled diabetes, but maybe it is a consequence or a comorbidity. And that's why we have plethora of guidelines for diabetes. Is there any guideline has included C cortisol level in the patient yet? No. We have landmark studies with anti-diabetic medicine. As I told, all possible po side effect and effect of medicine we know. Do we have any other landmark study for any single damn drug for treating hypercortisol like anti-diabetic medicine? So she is talking about hypercortisol, but no guideline does. ICMR guideline is also saying, where is hypercortisolism? We are treating diabetic patient. And the ominous octet, ominous octet years back was turned into dirty dozen. Then it came to sweet 16. And now we are talking again about ominous nine. But where is hypercortisolum here? Yes, it may be a hormone which is playing role at kidney, at adiposity, at uh, gut level, or even at a neurotransmitter level, but is it the main part, main core thing to treat? No, we have multiple things to address. Congestive heart disease, nephropathy, retinopathy, neuropathy, stroke, peripheral vascular disease to treat, not hypercortisolism. And these complications are more important than rather complicating this diabetes with hypercortisolism. Now, I would like to put the things in reverse order from treatment to diagnosis to prevalence. So treatment, first, she told surgery is the first line treatment. Yes, surgery will treat if you find the adenoma. But even after treating that adenoma and surgically removing this, it neither impacts on insulin sensitivity, nor improves glucose level, and even not improving hypertensive. Patient remains hypertensive even, see any Cushing patient, when you have treated for adenoma, still they remain hypertensive and you have to treat them then what is the fun of looking for the hypercortisol as well? Second thing, for cortisol increase, I mean hypercortisol may cushing patient, if they become diabetic, what is the treatment? Metformin to start with, why? Because we want to increase insulin sensitivity. So this is the chart. If Cushing disease or hypercortisol may, you are suspecting on one side, we have GLP-1, metformin, SGLT-2 to treat hypercort, I mean treat hyperglycemia in that patient. And yes, all the therapy, like pituitary related, pacidiotide, adrenal related, metaropone, and all uh, that uh, other treatment, and main the treatment mifepristone, what she was talking about. But let's see the medication available for this. Cabergolin for pituitary, 
reduces insulin resistance. Mifeprestone reduces insulin resistance. Pacirotide reduces insulin production. So everywhere, ultimately, by giving this medicine also for hyperglycemia per se, we are just treating insulin sensitivity and we are improving insulin sensitivity. Nothing else we are doing, then we have number of medicine available with us. And look about pacirotide. Though it is not available in India, but pacirotide itself can cause hyperglycemia. So uncontrolled diabetes, you are looking for hypercortisolemia and then you are treating with pacirotide and you are creating more hyperglycemia. So is it going to help? Mifepristone. Yes, mifepristone has ignited this thing because the catalyst study is having the second arm which is ongoing where mifepristone is being looked after if it is improving the outcome or not. Let's deep dive with mifepristone. It's a recommended for Cushing treatment patient to control hyperglycemia and those who are not the candidate for surgical treatment. But we have multiple risks. We have to screen patient. This is not a simple drug like metformin and SGLD2 that you can prescribe and patient will take and then nothing will happen. You have to look for all these things. And off-label use for post-coital emergency contraception, cervical maturation and adjunct therapy, it is used nowadays, not approved anywhere as a proper treatment for treating hyperglycemia for hypercortisol at present. And what about investigation? She was talking, she was a bit confused about how to diagnose patient. And I think many of us are still confused about this because it is confusing, but cost of diagnosis is more than the treatment. She described the DEXA suppressant test. Yes, it is very easy, very simple test, DEXA suppressant test. And after that, biochemical diagnosis requires 24 hours free urinary excretor cortisol, late evening salivary cortisol, diurnal rhythm cortisol secretion. See, these are the charges patient will have to pay from his pocket, at least in India, to diagnose that hypercortisolemia. And for further differential diagnosis, it is pituitary or what? We have to go for MRI, we have to go for ACTH, we have to go for localizing procedure that will add up to the bill. And after doing all this thing, there are physical stress, we can increase cortisol level, there are mental and psychiatric disorder like uh, any drug or alcohol abuse or anorexia nervosa can also increase this, metabolic abnormality can also increase this cortisol level. There may be taste related artifacts also. How many laboratories are doing serum cortisol so nicely that you will rely on that to treat that hypercortisolemia and false negative test is very common when there is renal clearance is affected or liver failure is there and many of our diabetic patients who are uncontrolled are already having some failure at liver level or kidney level how you will diagnose that patient and most importantly the false positive test see obesity is there obese patient is having hypertension you see you can see the prevalence type 2 diabetes with obesity 36 percent prevalent type 2 diabetes with dyslipidemia with obesity 30 percent so she was talking about 24 percent in uncontrolled diabetic patient were having hypercortisolemia but 30 percent people who are obese they are already having hypercortisolemia because of obesity it is it is a comorbidity or consequence rather than a cause what i was talking about and if you now I will from treatment to diagnosis to prevalence. Last part is I'm going in reverse order because HB1C remains uncontrolled. We all know this diab care result that 8.9 is the HB1C. And that is despite of whatever routine treatment. So all that patient we are going to screen for <laughs> Catalyst studies suggested that 24% is having this. But does all previous study backing that? No. First of all, be clear, this is about hypercortisolism. This is not only about Cushing syndrome. Cushing syndrome, diabetes is common. But see this hidden hypercortisolism symptoms in this hit uh, hico study, where 6.1% were having type 2 diabetes. And you can see another uh, data from the same investigator, 10% risk of diabetes in hidden Cushing syndrome. There is another study where subclinical hypercortism was found, 7%. There is another study where 14 articles were uh, included, uh, more than 2,000 patients. The prevalence rate was 3.4% for hypercortisolism and 1.4% for Cushing disease. So I will ask you people that how many patients have you faced problem with hypercortisolism last year? 
5, 10, 15, I think maybe lesser than that. So how many patients do you consider diagnostic test to evaluate hypercorrhism? Jiska treatment nahi hai, thik se. Jiska diagnosis karna difficult hai, hum hi confused ho jate hai. Aur jiska prevalence 1.4 se 3% se 24% ke bich mein kuch bhi hai. Are we going to see all uncontrolled diabetes? We will treat diabetes or we are going to treat that hypercortism which we don't know what to do after that. So my answer is hypercortism screening is difficult to control diabetes patient is fine. So we should incorporate in routine practice? No, because we can refine the identification of patient who may be at high risk for hypercortism though uh, through clinical studies and meta-analysis. But until we have data, we have medicine, we have strong concluded diagnostic tests available, it's too early for that. So my answer is no. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. Anjali will revert. Anjali has got written quite a few statements. So I guess what I anticipated as counter arguments wasn't enough. So I'm here again to rebut. Uh, whether hypercortisolism is a cause or a consequence, hyperglycemia in itself is a consequence. A consequence of an abnormal metabolism which creates complications. We want to prevent complications, so we are treating the consequence. Hyperglycemia is not a disease. We are treating a consequence of a disease. The disease may be abnormal metabolism causing obesity, then causing type 2 diabetes. Right? So if hypercortisolemia is also a consequence and by treating it, if I am able to prevent a complication, even if it is a consequence, I will treat it. I don't have to have that as a cause. So that's one rebut. Um, it is not there in the ominous octet, so it's now nine. Uh, we have a lot of anti-diabetes medications with which we can treat hyperglycemia. Why do we need to treat hypercortisolemia? Our anti-diabetes medications clearly aren't enough. And we need something more than anti-diabetes medications to manage metabolic problems. Surgery does improve outcomes in those where we find adenoma in terms of reducing the glycemic burden, in terms of reducing the hypertensive burden, and in reducing the mortality and morbidity. It improves life uh, quality and it in improves the number of years that the person lives. Older medications for hypercortisolism did not work for diabetes. Newer drugs may work, and if they work, I would definitely use them. Cost of uh, anti-hypercortisolism treatment, including evaluation is very high, is an argument. Cost of uncontrolled diabetes is also very high. The complications that occur because of uncontrolled diabetes, the complications, uh, amputations, cardiovascular illnesses, these also cost a lot. So if I have a way, to reduce that cost effectiveness of a treatment can be identified and can be managed. We do not have good laboratories, laboratories should improve. We cannot take not good laboratory as a reason for not treating our patients. It's not tested, how many people have you seen? We are not seen because we are not tested. And why are we not testing? Because we don't have treatment. So if Mifepristone and Rilaricont comes as a good therapy in US, I would accept it and if I have a treatment, I will diagnose and if I diagnose, I improve the outcomes. So that's my counter argument. Thank you, Anjali. Please try. My only answer to what uh, Dr. Anjali said, it is not about Cushing's disease and having pituitary edema or adrenal adenoma. It is about hypercortisolism. Just be frankly, I'm asking you, how many times after high cortisol level, you have screened patient and you got real that adenoma that we can surgically remove. And second thing, mifepristone may become a treatment. Is it now? No. So the answer is we don't know how to treat that my hypercortisolemia. So at present, best practice, treat diabetes, treat hypertension. And if in future, if we get proper therapy, yes, even I will be with you to speak with. Sir, how do the drug comes? It's approved in US for use of hypercortisolism. Of course, I understand that we should not take everything that is so happening I, in I US. I think we'll, we'll get the expert view now. Right. Yeah, we'll ask Dr. Palasha for his expert. Really interesting to see Full House at uh, 8 past PM. First, uh, you have to understand the title, Treating Hypercortisolism. First, in India, most common is exogenous 
hypercortisolism or exogenous Cushing. So any diabetic who is uncontrolled, taking some alternative medications or some drug history is very, very important, at least to rule out the exogenous hypercortisolism or exogenous Cushing. So first in India, it's very common that somebody is giving them steroids without knowing the patient. So you should ask the patient about the drug history. So that will be very easy. No debate in that, no cost, no science, just taking a history and just look at the clinical features. Second is about the subclinical versus overt Cushing disease. There is no debate about the overt Cushing requires treatment or not. Absolutely, I don't agree with uh, Dr. Piyush that uh, treating hypercortilism because of the Cushing surgically would not so, uh, see any benefits. There are lots of metabolic benefits, lots of osteoporosis benefit, survival benefit. So whom to suspect a subclinical and how to diagnose subclinical versus uh, overt Cushing biochemically. That is very important for the physician specifically to know. Overdight dexamethasone is a good cost effective screening test. If it is between 1.8 to 5, it is a subclinical. If it is more than 5, you should be investigating for a overt Cushing. The debate is about 1.8 to 5, whether we should be screening them or not. Now, whom to screen in a diabetic population? The study shows all who are more than 3 OADs, insulin with 2 medications, lots of our patients would be there. So, we should not be screening at present for subclinical Cushing for everyone, but somebody who has suddenly deteriorated in their glycemic control, have suddenly accelerated hypertension, has some evidence of osteoporosis, some proximal muscle weakness, some clinical features of the hypercortisol. We should not be missing out the overt Cushing. So any such subtle signs of hypercortisolism, we should be screening. About the subclinical cortisol is an emerging topic. There are data emerging. There are lots of confusion whether it's the effect or the cause, whether subclinical hypercortisolism by treating with a pharmacotherapy would lead to lots of adrenal insufficiency leading to lots of hypoglycemia also. So at present, subclinical hypothyroidism requires just observation to make sure that they don't become a overt pushing in future. Suppose you are uh, investigating and finding a subclinical uh, hypercortisolism. Uh, but overt hypercortisolism we should not be missing. Exogenous pushing or hypercortisolism as a cause of a uncontrolled hypertension, hypertension or a diabetes is not in common in our country. Just take for the drug history at least. Whether patient is taking steroids, patient has history of asthma, taking some Ayurvedic medications, skin lesions, arthritis are the common where people give steroids and people get benefits. So we should not be missing out in uncontrolled hypertension patients who are having a exogenous hypercortisolism. So that is there. About subclinical, I think we will require lots of uh, data in a large uh, population based study. I don't think we will get answer in next five years or so at least as of now. Thank you very much for your patience hearing.